I feel like traveling, traveling on. I feel like traveling on. Oh, my heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on one more time. Yes, I feel. heads to pray. I'd like to read a scripture that's precious to me. You can turn to it if you wish to. It's not our text, but Psalm 69, verse 5 and 6. And musicians, you can be seated, or you can go stand with the rest of them. Don't be seated yet. God bless you. Greetings to each one of you here. It's good to see uh, our brother from Arizona with us this evening. And I know I'm speaking to several new faces that uh, maybe have never spoken to or spoken with. God bless you, each one. <clears throat> this has been my prayer for a, a long time, Psalms 69, verse 5 and 6. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord, God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake. O oh God of Israel. <clears throat> because I stand up here knowing a lot of my faults and a lot of my failures and shortcomings and uh, <clears throat> it would grieve me to, uh, to know something, some of my shortcomings would to hinder the walk or a testimony of one of you or any of God's people, even those out in the world, <clears throat> to witness my faults and failures and shortcomings and uh, we just want to uh, 
stay surrendered that the Lord can use us, <clears throat> especially as I stand before you uh, in an uncomfortable position with all eyes upon me, and it's easy to revert back to uh, comfort zones that are not convenient for the gospel, shall we say. So let's just uh, bow our heads and just ask the Lord to uh, take the service this evening. Heavenly Father, before we even uh, look at our texts this evening, we just want to come before your presence, Lord, and just ask you to take the vessel, Lord, <clears throat> on both sides of this pulpit, Lord, and just help the speaker, Lord, to be surrendered out of the way, Lord, and may you take the insufficiencies and the faults and failures and everything that you've molded into this vessel, Lord, by your choice and choosing. Uh, take those, Lord, and get glory unto yourself through them, Lord. And help me, Father God, not to uh, get Ron Garvin in the way tonight. We just pray, Father, that the people will be lifted up, and blessed, helped, uh, benefited, Lord. I pray that you'll answer prayers this evening. I pray that the people have come expecting something from you, not something from me, Lord, but just expecting you to deliver, Lord, even in spite of, uh, of who would be standing at the pulpit, Lord. We just expect you to be standing here, Father. So we just surrender this vessel, Lord, to you. And I pray, Father, that each one out there, Lord, be surrendered, <clears throat> can get past their faults, failures, and foibles, Lord, and, and they can receive what you have for them tonight, Lord. And I pray that each one of us be blessed this evening. Father, you know I've got a lot on my heart and, uh, and not having the ability to deliver it, Lord, to my satisfaction. So I just want to step aside, Father, and I just want you to use the vessel, Lord. Uh, if you don't use the notes, that's fine, Lord. Just use the vessel, Father, for your honor and glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to our text while we're standing. Hebrews chapter 11. A couple of short scripture readings here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Hebrews 13, 8. Very familiar scriptures. Not bringing anything new to you tonight. Maybe from just a little different angle. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. May God's word bless us this evening. You may be seated. I just pray the Lord to help me to tie these things together tonight or to get out of the way and let him tie, tie these things together tonight. First of all, I wanted to apologize to Brother Kyle. I never did get a little note sent to you to uh, saying how much I appreciated Wednesday's service. And I was right on board with you from the very get-go. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're bringing a repeat service from Brother Chad, and uh, that's what I feel like I'm doing. But um, as Brother Kyle said, we each bring our own unique perspective to it. And if it takes three or four times for us to finally get it through our heads, then uh, that's the way it's got to be. But... Uh, Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Yes. So if I'm repeating what Kyle repeated, let it be established. And I pray what I say is lining up with the word and what Brother Kyle says. It doesn't matter if we line up with what Brother Chad says. If it doesn't line up with the word, then we're all off. So let's not establish it, two or three witnesses together that are off the word. Let's, let's get it on the word and uh, with the message of the hour, and, and then we can walk in confidence. Amen? Praise the Lord. So let's let this word be thoroughly established. Uh, you know, as I have gone over this for, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks now, and uh, today as I was uh, out working on the roads and uh, just going over this in my mind all day, so somehow I've got to take my sermon that I perfected over eight hours of work and jam it in to just a little short time. <clears throat> but there's, there's no hope for that. I don't even know that I can get all my notes in. I mean, if I just read through them, it would be a short service. But uh, uh, as I thought on it today, it just uh, became precious. So let me just get out of the way and, and, uh, and somehow and just allow the Lord to take this. And I don't know if I'll be able to follow my, my notes or not. But 
but just let the Lord have his, have his liberty uh, tonight. Now, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background. I haven't given you the title. Don't get impatient here. Uh, some of you know me. Some of you don't. Um, uh, I guess those that don't will, will get to know me. So here's a little background for the thought this evening. See that brothers and sisters in Pakistan, uh, they have weekly Bible studies, and I speak for them about once a month and usually always on a Saturday morning. Well, it was the end of July, and on a Friday morning before I, as I was leaving for work, I checked my uh, WhatsApp, and there was a text in there that says, uh, could you speak for us on Saturday? Now, that gave me less than 24 hours to prepare for a service, and I was totally unprepared. Uh, I'd been busy at work, just uh, didn't have a chance to hardly listen to messages. I took my message, messages and listened to them in the truck while I'm driving a truck, spraying tar and, uh, for the county roads. And, uh, but sometimes I just have to unplug it because I'm just too focused on what I'm doing and too distracted. So uh, this is the way it had been for quite a while. So i busy at work, busy at home with a big project. And here I've been asked to speak for Bible study in less than 24 hours or a little over 24 hours, I think it was. Uh, I was totally unprepared, and uh, so I went to work, and still, I thought, well, I'll just, just concentrate on the Lord and just get a blessing from the Lord today and see what I've got for the brothers and, and sisters on Saturday morning. Still busy, busy, busy. Finally, on the way home from work, I thought, what am I going to do? I only have 24 hours left. What am I going to do? And this title, this thought came to my mind, I'm going to use it for my title, it's kind of a unorthodox, which I guess is kind of a, a commonplace for me. Uh, the title for tonight is Don't, Do Not, Don't Fake It or Make It. Perhaps you've heard that slogan before. Had a good minister friend that uh, I was told that used to use, uh, say that quite a bit, fake it till you make it. And a good friend of mine, and I don't know that I ever heard him say that, but uh, that was what I'd heard somebody Tell me, that was kind of his slogan, fake it till you make it. And, uh, well, maybe what he meant by that was claim the promise until you receive it. And I'll agree with him on that. But as I was preparing for a service, uh, for a Bible study, the thought came to my mind, you know, you can fake it till you make it, but <laughs> I don't want to do that. <clears throat> so let's examine this a little bit tonight. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with Brother Branham's testimony when he was, uh, he had a stomach ulcer and he was still living at home with his parents and uh, uh, he claimed his healing and uh, he had eaten, I think he had eaten soup, beans and onions or something like that. He'd swallowed that down and I think he maybe vomited it up and just shove it back down and his mother says, you know, are you okay? So I'm fine. Now that, is that faking it till you make it? Well, he was claiming the promises. We wanna examine the difference. Claim the promise, even though you don't have the evidence it's not there before you, whether it's a physical healing or whatever your need is, claim it. If there's a promise for it, claim it. Don't fake it. We don't want to fake the promise. Let's claim the promise. We're also familiar with the uh, blind man that Brother Branham prayed for. And uh, Brother Branham said, well, you just keep on. He said, well, I'm not healed. He went through the prayer line. I think he went through twice. He said, you said you healed me. He said, well, you said you believed me. I said, well, what do I do? I can't see. I'm still blind. We'll, we'll keep claiming your healing. Praise the Lord, I'm healed, blind as a bat. Praise the Lord, I'm healed, blind as a bat. Now, that's not faking it. That's believing it. Faking it would be, go, would be go get in the car and say, I can see, I can see as good as anybody else, I'm taking off. That's faking it, because he couldn't see. But he was claiming it, and he claimed it until he became the laughing stock of the town, but he stood on that promise until it came to pass. Now, we admire someone who stands on the word and claims the promises, but I want to draw a distinction between claiming the promises and faking it. Uh, faith is the substance. Uh, now, maybe we can't really understand that. Maybe I, I don't. Well, here we, here we go. Right here's a good example. Just use myself as an example. I'm not going to fake it and claim that I understand this. Faith is a substance. You know, I can't hold on to faith. A substance is something you, you can touch and feel in my mind, you know. Faith is a substance, but there's a reality to it that is more more real than what you can touch. Do I understand it with my human mind? No, I'm not going to fake it, but I am going to claim it. Faith is a substance. Things hope for the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> so what's the difference between fake and faith? 
Well, it's got a snappy little, you know, my title's got a snappy little uh, rhythm to it. You know, fake it till you make it. So it's an easy little slogan to have there. Uh, so, uh, but what brought that to mind was, you know, being, having that Bible study, looking me in the face, less than 24 hours to prepare. What do I do? I had some options before me. I could decline the invitation. They would accept that. I've done that before when I was going to be out of town. Uh, these uh, Bible studies were over Skype, Skype meetings. So I had to cancel one. So I could cancel uh, or I could manufacture a Bible study, you know, fake it. Or I could m admit to the brothers that I just don't have anything. I, I don't have anything. Just be honest. So I hated to decline, but even worse than that would be to fake it. And that's when this little saying came to mind, and I began to examine the fallacy of this statement. And that's what, uh, when viewed from that standpoint, that uh, not just claiming it, but faking it. We don't want to do that. So I suppose we're all familiar with Brother Branham's prayer lines and how he stood helpless until the angel of the Lord showed up. He'd, he'd say, I, I can do nothing. He'd just kind of hem haul around, and he'd say, you know I'm, you know I'm, I'm stalling. I forget how, how he expressed it there. You, you know I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on something. I, I can't do anything, you know. If he doesn't come, then we'll just, uh, we'll just have a prayer line and bring it through and lay hands on you. Why would you try to fake discernment? You can't fake that. Uh, he knew better than that. He just admitted that he was helpless. You know, the human thing to do is to kind of press on because we don't want to lose face. And so we just press on, you know. And uh, somebody says, well, you're going the wrong way. Well, you, know, you get out here on the interstate, I'm supposed to head south on 75, and I make the wrong turn and head north, and my wife says, uh, uh, aren't we going the wrong way? I no, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. Here comes Beaver Dam, you know, way out of, way out of the way. Now, that didn't really happen, <clears throat> but uh, I have made the wrong turn before. Well, what are you going to do? You going to fake it? Yeah, I, I planned to come down this way. I had to check something out, you know. Uh, you going to fake it or just... Admit it, say, hey, yeah, I did. I think I better find an exit and get back on the right road. Let's be honest. Not just fake it till you make it, because you may not make it if you're going the wrong direction. So, so we could manufacture a Bible study. You could imitate the anointing of the Lord, impersonate an anointing. Uh, you could stir up the people's emotions with psychology, and, uh, and maybe they'd never know that you was just you know, flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, so I started out this Bible study with the Pakistan when this uh, thought came to me, and it ended up developing over just a few hours. I was put it together, and uh, I wasn't faking it. I was walking in faith at that point. God's given me a thought, and I'm just going to get up there, and I'm going to express it to him the best I know how, and that's what I'm doing tonight. I got a lot more notes, but still, I don't know how to put them together. I don't know how to touch each heart here, but he does. So if I can just get out of the way and allow him to do it, then he'll touch, touch the need. So speaking to the uh, Pakistanis, I wanted to make sure the interpreter was on the same page with me. <clears throat> so I said, make sure he understands my title. I says, do you know what fake is? He says, oh, yes, yes. F fake. That is the substance of things hoped for. The ev No, no, no. They got, got that wrong. Fake. F-A-K-E. Fake. Not faith. So I explained it to him. And as you begin to explain what fake means, means it becomes ever more apparent why we do not want to fake it till we make it. Uh, so we're going to look at a definition of that. Uh, it's not appropriate for a Christian to fake it till he makes it. Definition of fake, not genuine, counterfeit, a forgery or sham, the opposite of genuine. If there's anything we need in this day and age, it's genuine. We, need, we, do, we don't need fake. It's just a hindrance to the move of God. Uh, if you're sitting here as a fake Christian tonight, uh, don't leave this building in that same condition. Amen. You say, well, I can't do it. Well, you're on the right road now because you're admitting that. Right. Quit faking it, admit it, and, and, and get down to business with God, and he'll, uh, he'll take care of the rest of it. A few synonyms for fake. Forgery, counterfeit, copy, sham, fraud, hoax, imitation, fraudulent, false, bogus, worthless. Invalid, dud, artificial, pretend, to dupe or doctor, forge, falsify, alter, or tamper with. You don't want that to be your testimony. 
Is that our testimony with this Word of God? Are we altering it? Are we doctoring it? So many people can be a fake message believer. But to do that, they have to alter the message. I'm a message believer. I go to a message church, but that doesn't apply to me. I don't need to fulfill that. That's not for me. This is not my time. That's not to be manifested through. Let's not alter it. Let's not tamper with it. Let's not doctor it up. Is there anything that you've heard in that definition so far that would inspire you? Say, yes, I want to fake it till I make it. I don't think there's anything that was, uh, would be uh, uh, inspiring us to do that. Um, you know, the way I've seen the Lord move, he'll just, uh, through me, you know, it's not me, but just, it's just the way he, I guess, I guess it's every minister, but it's always uh, stands out to me when he does it takes his finger and puts it right on a sore spot. And, uh, and I'm the tip of that finger, you know, and it touches. So if it touches a sore spot tonight, that's him speaking to you. He doesn't want fake Christians. If that's the way you're doing, if that's the way you're living, uh, well, let's just go ahead and push on that sore spot a little bit because we don't want you going out of here like that. I don't want me. I don't want me going out of here like that. So another way to phrase this, fake it till you make it, Another way to phrase it would be impersonate a Christian until you become a Christian. Uh, that, that doesn't sound very uh, good. Pretend you have the Holy Ghost until you get the Holy Ghost. Why? Don't do that. Act like something you're not until you become what you are, what you're pretending, pretending to be. Um, imitate your healing before, healing before it happens. Uh, my title is don't do that. Don't fake it till you make it. Don't be an impersonator. Don't be a pretender, a liar, a Pharisee, a hypocrite a fake, an imposter, a counterfeit. Uh, we can fake a physical healing, but that's just a hoax. You know, we can say, well, I've, I've injured my leg, but it, it's all better, and I just walk like this because I like this swagger. No, uh, it's, just a, it's just a hoax. It's a fraud. You're falsifying the truth. You're, you're duping the people, and people see through that. Uh, they see through it. It's worthless. That was part of our def definitions, a dud. Anybody want to be a dud? You know, back, in, back when I was in school, the big, uh, big uh, insult to people is to say, you know, loser, you big loser, uh, you big dud. I guess that probably goes back before my time. But it's all one and the same. Anybody here want to be a dud? A dud Christian, a dud believer. <clears throat> we don't want to fake being anointed for the preaching. We won't, don't want to get up and pretend like we've got a message from the Lord and just... Uh, stir the people up and uh, jump up and down and, and, and pretend like we're something and God's done something for us and he's got something to speak. God has set the, the gifts in order. Yeah. Brother Branham set the gifts in order. Speaking in tongues is to bring a, a direct message to the people, yeah. not just up there entertaining. Amen. And the, the Pentecostals could not mature they could not accept that, and so they rejected him partly for that. Uh, we, don't want to, we don't want that to be the way the ministry is either. Just getting up here and entertaining you and letting myself or the minister, whoever he is, get in the way and entertain the people. God's got something he wants to speak. Now, let's get out of the way and let him do so. And if you haven't got something to speak, then just admit it and sit down. Uh, you say, well, I, I, I want to save face. Not in this situation, you don't want to save face. Uh, you better be honest. Amen. To be a sham or a con artist, that's, which is what you would be up here. You know, you, we uh, are familiar with the uh, snake oil salesman back in the old days, uh, traveled around with a wagon, had the cure-all for everything, and that's just a con artist, just a sham. That's got no place in God's economy, Amen. and especially not behind the pulpit. We don't want to pretend to have the mind of Christ on a subject. You know, it's so easy when people come up, you know, if you're a minister, if you're traveling overseas, and, brother, what should I do about this situation, you know? Uh, well, well, brother, tell you what you need to do. You know, we've always got the mind of Christ for the other person. Uh, now, when it comes to our own situation, what do I do, what do I do? But, oh, brother, what you need to do, you, you need to move here, you need to move there, you need to go here, you need to do this, uh, as if God has spoken that directly to us. Now, maybe he has. If so, then speak it. But don't be a fraud. Don't be a pretender. Don't be a fake. Don't fake it till you make it. And say, oh, I know exactly what you need to do. You're faking it. 
If you're faking it, don't do that. Uh, it's, that's a dud. It's worthless. Uh, you lead somebody astray just like the scripture read in uh, Psalm 69. Your fear of losing face is going to be a stumbling block to somebody because when they follow your uh, leadership because well, that brother had the mind of the Lord for me and I went and done this and I went and done that and it all falls apart and you're left there holding the pieces how can you ever have faith in that brother again? It's worthless. <clears throat> be genuine, the opposite of fake. Admit you don't have the mind of the Lord if you don't. If you do, speak it. Speak it in confidence. With two or three witnesses, bring it back to the Bible. Bring it back to the Word. So, well, well the Word says, brother, um, God can use an honest vessel to speak through. And I pray that he does that tonight. Brother Branham didn't pretend to be able to discern the, the thoughts of the people's hearts. Uh, there's no need to be a fake with that. That was a genuine gift. It was God's gift. It was God operated it. Uh, it wasn't Brother Branham's gift. It wasn't, now understand what I'm saying here. He had the gift, but he didn't go acquire that gift. God gave that gift to him, and that was God's gift to the people through him, using him. But he could not just operate that by himself. He just had to rely upon the Lord, and he was honest enough uh, to say, I can do nothing until he comes and does it through me. And we find ourselves in the same position. No matter if you're behind the pulpit or if you're out there, whatever you're doing in life, it isn't our responsibility to manufacture the Holy Ghost or any of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. It's not up to us to manufacture our healing, our faith, uh, our revelation. We're supposed to pray for revelation. Amen. Brother Bram didn't say go conjure up your revelation. Don't go manufacture your revelation. Don't go work it up. He said, pray for it. So it's not our responsibility to bring revelation to ourselves. Well, if I study this message and I read through it and I dissect it and I word diagram it and I, you're getting nowhere. You're wasting your time. Go back to the beginning. Brother Bram said, if you study a flower for, I forget what it was, 30 minutes, sincerely, you know more than, than they could teach in the, Sunday, in the uh, seminaries. Uh, you know more about God if you just approach things in the right manner. It's God's responsibility to keep his word, not you. Just like a wife is not responsible to, to run out and, and provide for the man, and, and we understand those situations come, come up sometimes, and the man's able, not able to or whatever, and the wife has to step in there and help, but it's not, it's not her responsibility to, to do all the work and to defend the man and... and uh, as a wife of Jesus Christ, we, we're not responsible to make his words come true. If the husband gives his word to somebody, it's not the wife's responsibility to keep that word. He gave his word. He needs to be the one to keep it. And if God gave his word, it's not for us to, to try to, to manufacture. So if he calls a man to the ministry, it's God's responsibility to give him something to say. It's God's responsibility to touch the hearts of the people through that gift. If it's, uh, if it's just a man up there faking it, uh, you know, maybe you'll fool some people. Uh, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll do something. But in an eternal sense, uh, what good is it? Our responsibility is to be surrendered for his use. <clears throat> it's not our responsibility to be... Uh, manufacturing a sermon, coming up with something to say because I know that brother's going through this hard time and, and this sister's doing this and, and we've got this situation in the church and I need to, to get up there and solve it for the Lord. That's, that's useless. You say, well, shouldn't you do a little bit of studying and praying? Well, I think that's part of being surrendered. <clears throat> but our faith and our confidence doesn't come in our ability to pray or to study. It's solely upon his calling. And that's, that's all I can say because the closer I get to, to coming out for the pulpit, you know, all had a wonderful time thinking on these notes today, and I couldn't wait to deliver them. And I sit back there, and the time draws near, and I think, this is a shambles. How, am I, how in the world am I going to get it all together? It's not my responsibility. It's his. <clears throat> He's called me. It's his responsibility to use the gift as he, would, uh, use, as he would desire to. My responsibility is just to get out of the way, let him, let him do it. And then I can rest. Are you a little nervous, Brother Ron? Well, yeah, there is always that element there, but uh, I can nervously rest somehow. <laughs> but we're not going to get up here and fake it till we make it. 
He's already made it for us. <clears throat> Amen. That's where our faith is, that he's already made it. In trying to get the concept of this uh, little slogan over to the brothers in Pakistan, I use this example. Um, thought that it'd be something they could understand. So why would I counterfeit, if I was going to go to Pakistan, why would I make a counterfeit passport? I've got, I've got the real thing. It's, it's genuine. It's approved. It's been used. It, it's, it's good. It, it will work. <clears throat> why would I go forge one? Why would I make a counterfeit one? Why would I fake one? If I've got the genuine article, why? The only ne- reason you would need to forge a document like that is if you're unable to get the genuine article. And the only reason you could not get a genuine passport is maybe you're not qualified. Well, you can get qualified. Maybe you're a, a, an immigrant or a, maybe you don't have all your proper documentations, but if you follow them, if you just go to the website there and you follow the rules, fill out all the documents, send them in all the proper th- things, and, and you're a, an upstanding citizen, a, a competent individual, a law-abiding, you, there's no reason you cannot get a genuine U.S. passport. Uh, I don't know all the qualifications for those, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Uh, maybe you've got something in your past. Uh, there's ways to get those things cleared from your record and, and, become a, and get a passport. Uh, so if just go about it legally, then you don't have to worry when you, go to the, when you go to the airport and you hand that to them. When I arrived in Pakistan and, and you hand it to the guy and he gets it out and he's got his magnifying glasses on, he puts it under the light, and he really examines that, and he looks you in the eye and he looks back at that, and he looks you in the eye. There was no nervousness on my part. I'm not faking it. That's the genuine article. If he's got a problem with that, then he needs to talk to the State Department. He needs to talk to the... To whoever issued, he doesn't need to talk to me. That's not my problem. Amen. If he's got a problem with it, then we got we to go somewhere else. Uh, so I could go with confidence. I didn't have to wet, uh, sweat it out or, or worry that uh, this is not going to go through. But if you've got a forged document, you just hope your forgery is, is sufficient to get you through. Now, you may forge a document here and, and be able to pass it through, um, but you're not going to forge your Christianity you're not going to fake your Christianity and slip that past the Lord. You may get it past, you know, I could probably print a, a, a fake dollar bill on, my, on a good printer and I might be able to deceive one of you, just pass it off to you and you'd, well, you'd just trust me and take it and, and go on. But, you know, anybody that's really trained would, would understand that that's not a real dollar bill. You know, that's, that's just on cardboard, you know, whatever it is. And uh, you, I may fool you, but... You're not going to fool somebody that knows anything about it, you know, somebody that works at a bank or, or the, uh, you know, the treasury department. You're not going to fool them, and you're not going to fool the Lord with your fake uh, Christianity. You may fool me, and I said, well, that's a, that's a really good brother. He just is so attentive in church, and he just really amens, and he's really responsive to the word, and, and he's just all about it, and he just, he's right there for all the things. And you may fool me, but are, really are you who you need to get this approved by. You don't need to, you don't need to uh, get my uh, recommendation to get into heaven. We've got we've to pass this by the judge. And the Lord, he knows. He knows all the time that, that you're just faking it. Kind of like Adam and Eve faking. <clears throat> their, but he knew what, was, what their condition was. So if you just follow all the rules, sign all the documents, send all the proper documentation in to get your passport, You'll get it. Just trust, rest. Rest is the thing. Now, I know bureaucracy takes a long time to, to grind around full circle, and, uh, but if you've filled out everything, just, just rest. Don't get impatient because it, it'll take a couple weeks to get it and, and don't say, I've, I've got to have it. I've got to have it now. I've got to go print my own. I've got to make my own. I've got to forge it. Just rest. Just rest. Same thing with the promises of God. If you've filled out all the, if you've done everything that the book says and you've left no stone unturned, rest. Rest on it. Then you can claim the promise. Don't fake it. Say, I've got a promise right here. It says. It says I'm healed. It says I'm, I've, he's promised the Holy Ghost to me. He's promised whatever it is that, that you're claiming. If you can see it in there, you can claim it. Just rest. Let him bring it to pass. Don't try to go out and manufacture it and say, well, I haven't seen you I'm praying for the Holy Ghost. I just haven't seen it, so I'm, I'm going to get up speaking speak in tongues this Sunday, and I just, I've been practicing. You're faking it. Right. Right. Quit that nonsense. 
Rest in the Lord. Rest in him. It takes a while for government, to, for their bureaucracy to finally get that passport back to you. But when you get it back, it's the genuine article. You don't have any worries about it. Uh, let the Lord fulfill his promises. Then you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to, if, you, if you're praying for a physical healing, you don't have to imitate that. Oh, I'm, I'm better. I'm better. Yeah, this, this limp is just uh, because I kind of got used to it, kind of liked it. No, there'll be no limp. You know, if, if God touches you and heals you in that way, just, just rest on the Lord. Then you don't have to fake anything. Just follow the procedures. Uh, the only reason you can't receive a promise from God, maybe you're ineligible. See, there are qualifications. Uh, you want to receive the Holy Ghost? There's a promise for it. But you've got to follow the procedures. Been baptized, repented first, not penance. We don't do penance. Repentance. Repent, turn from your ways. Claim that promise. Is there any stone left unturned? Uh, or do you, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of documents you've got to do when you, when you send off for a passport. You've got, oh, I don't know, birth certificates and all these records and stuff you've got to send in. And, and you've got to have a sealed envelope and a self-addressed and all the postage paid. And that may be for the, uh, I think, I know you have to do that when you're applying for a visa. But there's, there's procedures that you've got to go through. You can't just write on a post, you know, a sticky note that says, hey, I'd like to have a passport. Send it off to them. It ain't going to pass. Well, maybe you do. Follow the procedures. You'll get it. Hey, hey, Lord, I'd, I'd like to have the, the Holy Ghost. That'd be great. You know, I'd, that'd be, that'd be kind of neat. You can have it. You got to follow the procedures. Don't leave any stone left unturned. When I'm sending off that kind of stuff to, to go overseas, I, I'm reading through there. I'm rereading through there. And have I missed anything? I've got, have I got everything? Have I sent in the right money order in? Am I, and kind of makes you a little bit nervous have I got everything right but when you get everything right then you can rest you put it in the mail and you just rest and you wait upon the Lord to uh, upon well wait upon the Lord to, to bring it back to you when you're doing a applying for a visa because uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to get a visa but I can rest when I send off for a visa because that's kind of dependent on the country that you're going to is like whether they'll accept you or not and I said well if they don't, then it's not the Lord's will. But if God wants me to go, they'll accept it. I don't care how tarnished my record is or w whatever they don't like about it. Uh, he'll pass it through so we can, we can rest on that. You know, if you get impatient and you forge a passport, that's one of the things that'll disqualify you from getting a genuine passport. Don't go forge one. I wonder if that would also disqualify us from getting the, the Holy Ghost. We go forging, faking, uh, committing fraud, getting up and pretending like we're something. That may just disqualify us. You know, I, I didn't think about that till now. If you're just faking it, God may just let you fake it until you get tired of it. And finally come to him and say, Lord, I got to be honest. I haven't got the goods. I don't have what I want. I'm tired of faking it. Lord, give me the real deal. Now you can rest because you finally become genuine. You finally become honest. Amen. <clears throat> you know, my original thought for the Pakistani Bible study was, I don't want to pretend to have a Bible study. You know, if, God is, if God's not giving me one, if he doesn't do something for me, I, I've either got to cancel or I've got to just get up here and say, well, God bless you, brothers. Uh, God hasn't given me anything. Let's not, let's not fake it. Uh, you know, as a, as a minister, there's always a pressure there. You've got to, get, you've got to have a sermon, you know, if, if, if Brother Chad asks you, could you speak for us? Well, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Now I've got to go manufacture something. No, you don't. You better not. Amen. Uh, if God doesn't give it, then uh, be better off just to get up here and say, God bless you, saints. God is good. He hasn't given me anything. <laughs> I don't know what you'd do, but, but let's not be faking it. Amen. You know, you could get up here and, and use your impressive preacher's voice, and I need to practice on that one, I guess. Maybe we could fool the people. Uh, get up here and be dynamic. I'd have to practice that one too. Jump around, whatever. Uh, maybe I'd fool somebody. But I, I think you would probably all see right through that. And I think you'd be kind enough to pray for me. <clears throat> 
Brother Branham didn't fake his gift. He was helpless to discern the thoughts of the people, and he admitted to that. He'd, he'd say, I'm just waiting for the angel to come. Brother Branham had a lot of contemporaries in the uh, uh, healing ministries, in the tent ministries uh, when he was on earth, and uh, at the same time, and it seemed like their ministries were bigger, better, more powerful, more impressive. Uh, and I wonder how much of that was just fake. Uh, because, you know, I'm, I don't know how true it is, but you hear stories, well, this one fell, that one fell, this one went up here, this one went there, just up there faking it, drawing people, because there was a spirit on the, on the land at that time, and, and the spirit of God was moving, and, and men just tapped into that and got up there and faked it and, and made a name for themselves, and they still do today, uh, and they could even do it right here in, in, the, in the message of the hour and uh, make a name for yourself and impress people and pull people, but it's worthless if it's not from the Lord. But Satan puts a pressure on a minister to, to perform. I suppose he puts it on all of us as a Christian to perform. You, you've got to be there. You've got to get to the prayer meeting. You've got, you, you've got, you need to sit on the front row you, just, so you can stand up. Everybody see how religious you are and, uh, you know, People's got to see this, and uh, he puts a pressure on us to perform like a, like a high-pressure salesman. But we don't have to jump through the devil's hoops. You know, Moses, Moses didn't. Remember when Janus and Jambers uh, performed the same miracle that he did? Uh, Brother Branham said in the anointed ones at the end time, he says, did Moses fuss at him and say, here, here, you can't do that. I'm the only one been ordained to do that. Here, you stop that right now. He just let him go. Let him go on. Remember, the Bible said... As their follow is made manifest, so will these in the last day be made manifest when the bride is raptured and taken into the sky. <clears throat> There's no need to jump through the devil's hoops. We don't, we don't have to say, you know, hey, you, you minister, you can't be doing that. You're preaching the message. You, you, you can't do that. You, that's not our job. Let's just be genuine and do what God's called us to do, and, and God will make manifest the true and the false. A uh, couple of quotes from... Uh, 1953 series, Israel and the Church. <clears throat> Brother Bram says, let's go back now and get the beginning and find out how sure this word is. Now, bear this in mind, as we glean through this Bible, you'll see that the cogs of God's wheels turn slow but sure. It may look like it's a million miles away, but she's grinding right up there all the time. And one of these days, it'll be here. In a couple services later, still in that same series, he said, God's word must every time be fulfilled. We could preach on that. That is just an astounding statement. So that's pretty simple. But let that soak in. God's word must every time be fulfilled. If he's promised in his word that there will be a bride, there's going to be a bride. If he's promised whatever it is that you have need of, it's going to come to pass. It's his word. The cogs of God's prophecy grind slow but sure. If you do wrong, you think you're getting by, but just remember, young man or woman, it's going to grind right up to your door one of these days. You'll wonder when and how, but it'll be there. You'll reap what you sow every time. God spoke it. It's got to be so. Thy word is settled in heaven forever. It's already said. I love this statement here. They don't argue about it up there. It's already settled. We argue about it. But in glory, it's settled. We may want to say, well, the Holy Ghost isn't, isn't manifested in this day and age. But if God said it is, it is. You can argue with it. You can say, well, it's only for the 12, 12 disciples. It's settled in heaven it's done deal. We don't need to argue about it. We don't need to get up and say, hey, hey, you can't teach that. Uh, it's a done deal. <clears throat> can't you just settle it in your heart tonight? Lord Jesus, I believe you. That settles it. Hallelujah. I'm coming now. I want you to give me the baptism of the Spirit, and you'll get it right there. All right. Then forever God will seal you by the Holy Spirit until the day of your redemption. All right. The cogs of God's machine grind slow, but if there's a promise in the Bible, healing, Holy Ghost, salvation, salvation of your family, whatever it is that you're praying about and you have need of, it's already settled in heaven. We don't need to be arguing. Other people may argue about it, but as believers, we shouldn't be arguing about it down here. If they're not arguing about it up there, let's not argue about it down here. I said, Lord, I don't understand it. Somehow you said you'd forgive me for all my past. I take you at your word. You said you'd fill me with the Holy Ghost when I was baptized and repented. I've done that, Lord. 
Now just let the cogs grind on slow. It'll arrive in perfect time. <clears throat> the wheels of God's timepiece time piece roll slow but sure. This brought an example to mind, and as you know, I've done a little farming all my life. I'm kind of retired from that now, but on this farm, I've spent many an hour riding on the hay wagon behind the square baler. So I want to just tell you a little story about that. Now, the hay baler, it puts out a square bale, 18 inches wide, 14 inches thick, about three feet long. And you stand on the wagon, and as it comes out of the baler, you take it by the two strings, you walk it to the back of the wagon, you, you set it down, you walk back to the front, you get the next one that comes off, and you walk back, and you keep stacking it, stacking it until you get all the way to the front. You get a full wagon, you unhook it, hook another empty, and you keep on going. I spent many an hour on that <clears throat> New Holland hay baler, stacking the hay to take it to the barn. These bales are about 60 pounds or so, unless you get in some wet hay, then it may be heavier than that. But 60 pounds is about right for a little skinny farm boy. <clears throat> so I'd like to explain the mechanism. Uh, I know all you sisters are getting ready to fall asleep. We got a spiritual lesson to this. So, so you just listen. We're not just up here telling stories. Brother Branham didn't just get up here and tell stories. I don't think the Lord inspired this <clears throat> just for humor or uh, entertainment or just to pass the time. <clears throat> so let me explain. Now, I'm from the 60s era myself, and so these balers that we worked on were old at that time. They were from, from the 60s and 70s. So I don't know what the new ones, they may be set up a little different, but I'm talking about the old style. Now they don't even need a guy on the wagon. They've, they've got different setups. Back in the old days, it was the little boys riding on the, on the wagon. So you hook this baler, square baler, hook it up to the tractor, put the hitch pin in it, hook a PTO shaft, that's a power takeoff. That clicks onto the back of the tractor, <clears throat> and then you, you throw a lever or a clutch there to engage that, and that PTO shaft begins to spin. That PTO shaft drives a big flywheel, big steel wheel, and it begins to spin. Optimum speed's about 540 revolutions per minute. <clears throat> As that's spinning, that flywheel's connected to a gearbox. And that gearbox drives these gathering teeth gathering tines, and they pick the hay up off the ground, and they pull it into the baler. And then there's, uh, I would call them uh, uh, cross-feed tines is what I'd call them. There's these tines that take, take that hay as it comes up, and they slide it over into the bale chamber. And they go over. Everything's keeping time with the flywheel. <clears throat> well, also in that gearbox, there's a big plunger, 14 inches tall, 18 inches wide, the same size as the bale. That's the size of the, of the bale chamber. The hay comes in there, and that plunger punches it, and it's just a steady rhythm. So I've spent many an hour standing on that wagon, and the wagon's rocking, and the baler's rocking as that plunger, big old heavy thing, it's a plunging, and it's making a, it's going at 540 RPM, that plunger's making, oh, 70 or 80 strokes per minute. One stroke in less than a second. Big whoop, whoop, whoop. I can hear it now. Whoop. And the wagon is just kind of rocking back and forth because everything's, everything's working there. And that flywheel's spinning, the plunger's plunging, it's got a big blade. So as the hay goes in, it got a big blade and it cuts it off, plunges it, compacts it. Those tines have got to get out of the way because if they don't, that plunger will just snap them right off and then you're done bailing for the day. So everything's in perfect time. We're thinking of God's timing. Everything's in perfect time. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And as the tractor goes down through the, through the, uh, um, through the hay field, there's big mounds of dried hay in big, long rows. Sometimes those stacks of hay, they may be this, this big and this wide. And as that, the gathering ties pull it up in there and the cross-feed ties, they throw it into the chamber and that plunger is just plunging away, cutting it and plunging it. And everything looked like making a lot of noise and, and, and a lot of dust and a lot of things going on. But in the back, there's a fascinating mechanism to me. It's called the knotter. It's a little unit there. It sets up there, and it ties the knots in the hay stream. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there, not doing a single thing. All this work going on. Tines are working, cross feed going, flywheels are spinning, the plungers are plunging. Tractors are groaning and grunting, and the guy on the wagon, he's a, he's a working, and the nodders just sit there, not doing a single thing. There's not much happening on the back of that baler. 
except for one little wheel. It's a little star-shaped wheel about that big. And it, as the hay comes into the chamber, that little wheel touches it, and it just turns ever so slowly. And as that turns slowly, it drives a shaft. And there's a lever on that shaft. And as that shaft turns, it slowly goes. It'll only go up about two inches. Slowly raises. Very, you can hardly watch it. You, I mean, if you're getting a lot of hay going in there, you can, see the, you can see the metering wheel, they call it. You can see the metering wheel turning very slowly. But you can hardly see that lever. That lever slowly raises. And when it gets to the top, it releases, snaps a clutch. As the plunger comes back out of the chamber, two, two needles with strings attached to them come up through the bottom. The plunger comes back, and it's getting ready to come right back in there and snap those needles off. It comes up there. The knotters flip in a split second, tie the knots, cut the strings. The needles come back out. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Back going at it again. And then nothing's happening in the back. Just that little wheel slowly turning. Knotters just sitting there. Needles just sitting there. Nothing's happening. <clears throat> but that metering wheel is slowly turning, marking out the time, marking out the length of that bale. It knows when to tie the bale. The guy on the tractor, he doesn't determine that. The guy on the wagon, he doesn't determine that. They can adjust it and, as they need to. But when everything's set properly, they just need to wait. Maybe that tractor and that wagon go a quarter mile down the road because, because maybe there's not much hay, just a little bit. And there's not enough to make a bale. Don't get up there and try to tie the bale. The metering wheel knows when it's time to tie the, tie the bale. Just rest. <clears throat> so that, that flywheel is just hitting. Whoop, whoop. And we think, you know, in our lives, nothing's happening. I said, Lord, nothing's happening. I pray for something, nothing happens. It's just that same old grind of every day. Go to work, clock in, clock out. Whoop, whoop. Go to church, Sunday, Wednesday, nothing's happening. Lord, what are you doing? What's happening? Nothing's happening in my life. But his wheel is turning, Amen. measuring, knowing the right time to trigger everything. And then when it does, everything's got to work instantly within less than a second because that plunger is coming right back in less than a second. Everything's got to get up there, tie the knots, get, get out of the way, and go right back to the same old mundane, Monday through Friday, wash the kid's face, feed them their breakfast, clean up after them, go to church, come home, clock in, clock out, whoop, whoop, whoop. Nothing's happening. God knows. He's got a metering wheel on your life and my life. Lord, what's happening? I know I felt that way. Um, and this isn't in the notes, so we're just going to go with it. There was a time, oh, been a long time ago, uh, that I was in that same condition. Go to church, come home. What's going on? Just doing the same thing. Go and run the sound at church and record the services and, and go home. Go to church and come home and go to school or go to work and just, Lord, what have you got for my life? And I remember, I, I think I've told this here before, sitting at the family camp down in St. Mary's, and just sitting there on the tailgate of my truck playing the guitar. And somebody walked by me, and I don't know who it was, and because uh, I didn't really know anybody at the camp. Somebody walked by, turned around, come back. They said, uh, if you'll read the message, the oddball, you'll find the answer to your question. And I thought, okay, thank you, brother. Did I have a question? <laughs> didn't know I had a question. Uh, because I got caught up in that just whoop, whoop, just the same old mundane everything. But in my heart, there was a question. And so I went home, read that message, and probably on the first page or two. Uh, Brother Branham, there's two sermons titled The Oddball. The one he was speaking to, uh, Brother Gene Goad and Leo Mercer, I believe, believe it was. He was saying, I knew these boys had more that they could do than just make tapes. That's what I was doing. Just tape the service, run the sound, mail out the tapes to those who couldn't get the service, and just, just the same old mundane. Womp, womp, womp. And the question in my heart was, Lord, what have you got for me? What, what is there? And that was the answer to my question. Everything clicked. Then it went back to mundane again. 
I had the answer to my question. Okay, God, you, there's more that I could do. What is it? It's not your time to get up there and try to tie the strings and force the needles up. Let's, let's go do something. Just wait. You got your answer. Okay, let's wait. Let that little wheel keep right on turning. Then the time come up, invited to go to Pakistan, and, uh, and that's all history now. Uh, and there was none of my doing. It was just waiting upon the Lord, that, that little wheel turning, turning, turning. Well, let's, let's, let's look back. Remember those times, and, and then don't forget them today. Because <clears throat> so, you and I both can be sitting here thinking, Lord, what is there? There's got to be something more. What, what can we do? Here we are sitting, uh, COVID-19, we can't do anywhere, can't go traveling, we can't go ministering. What, what can we do? And it just becomes the same old mundane. Womp, womp, womp. But everything's working just right. That little meter wheel is turning. When the time comes, it'll click. Everything will work unless you go faking it till you make it. Now you're out of, now you're in trouble. You go trying to fake it till you make it. You don't mess with that bailer. There's, everything's got to be in time. You don't want anything out of time. Uh, the old bailers that I had were not exactly in perfect time and all the time shearing little bolts that are safety bolts in case something got out of time. I should have invested my, in them as a stockholder in, in the company. I was buying so many of those things because the old bailers wore out and there's too much play and slop, and, and we would shear bolts left and right. Uh, but when it's perfectly tuned, don't mess with it. Don't mess with the tension. You won't cut your strings. Your, your knots won't tie tight. Uh, don't mess with the timing. Everything's got to work perfectly. Just sit back, rest, let it, let it do its thing. If you're riding on the wagon, you just wait. The bail will come to you. Praise the Lord. You know, when that, uh, that plunger's going into that baler, when the hay is real thick, that plunger may, it may only make five or ten strokes and you've got a bale. And then five or ten more strokes and you've got another bale and it's just pumping them out and, and you have to run with that bale to the back of the wagon and put it in place and run back and get an next one. Usually you try to have two guys on the on the wagon so that you don't just wear yourself out running back and forth, back and forth. Uh, but then when the hay gets short later in the season or you've got a field that maybe just doesn't have a lot of hay in it, maybe you've had a dry year or a, a different type of hay, just grassy hay or something, uh, the hay's not very thick, but yet you need to gather it because you've got to feed the animals. And you may drive a long way and that plunger may, it may make 200 strokes, I don't know, it may make 400 strokes before it actually... Uh, brings a bale out, it doesn't matter. We're not counting strokes, we're counting the bale. It's not how long you've been in the message or how long you've served the Lord or, or how much you've done for this or that or what you've given in the offering. That's, that's not it. When you're full, you're full. When you're done, you're done. He's not going to pull you out of that baler until you're the proper size. Uh, but we're in a gleaning time now. You know, back in the Philadelphian church age, back in brother, when Brother Branham was uh, having the healing ministries, there, there's a lot happening. There was, you could go to the meetings, and I didn't. I was before my time, but, but people were coming to the altar, filling the altars up. The, the, the Word of God was spread around the world during the, uh, the Philadelphian church age, and a lot of things happening. Well, we're in a gleaning time. And when, when you get all the, all the field bailed, all the windrows have been picked up, but there's just little bits and pieces around the edges that maybe got missed. They fell out of the side of the baler. The tractor driver got off a little bit, or uh, the wind blew it and scattered it. Now, I was always uh, the one that would kind of go around and try to clean it up a little bit. So you're just driving, driving, driving all over, and that plunger is just plunging constantly. That's when the, the wagon shakes because there's nothing in there to take the impact, and you're just, you're just waiting. And you're just going, and, and it uh, seems like nothing's happening. But the meter wheel is still measuring each one out. And we're in a, we're in a gleaning time. It may not seem like a lot's going on in your life or around the message or however, but God knows. And his timing is perfect. And if we'll just wait on him, not faking it, 
till we make it. You can go grab that lever. You know that lever that I said only goes up about two inches? And when it gets up to, two in, gets up to the top, it releases because it's under tension. It's under pressure. You've got to have te- tension and pressure in your life. It's under tension. It's under pressure. And it goes up and then it gets to the top, releases that pressure, a clutch is thrown, and everything works perfectly. The needles, the knotters, everything. You could go up there and you can grab that lever and you can jerk it up and you get a short bail because it's not time. The metering wheel has not said it's time, but you can jerk it up. And sometimes you do that at the end of the season and you need to get all the hay out of there, but the last bale is not quite complete. It's, uh, it's a short bale. It's, it's not tied. It's just waiting for more material, but there's no more material. All the material has been picked up. It's late in the season. It's time to put the baler away. You get it running. You go out there and you pull that thing up. Everything ties off. And then you pull that last bale out of there. And it may be just a short one. You know, maybe we're just waiting on that last short Christian to come in, that last, last seed of God. Well, well, he'll know when it's ready. And he'll, he can pull the lever. But, but you don't need to be doing that. The guy on the wagon, he can, he can get all impatient and say, I, I, I want to stack some hay. I'll go down there and pull that up. Well, he's going to have a short bale. Now what's he going to do with that? It's not going to fit. Everything's going to be out. And the, and the farmer, one in charge, is not going to be happy to have this little short bale. <clears throat> we don't want to fake, fake it till we make it. We don't want to try to manufacture our own experience or however you want to say that. When God knows that you've got everything in you that you need, that metering wheel will tell it that it's time. And God can seal you. And you won't feel, fool God's, God's metering wheel. We can't go jerk that wheel up and get tied and be, come out of short bail. Uh, no, that's faking it. It's not, not going to work. So we may seem, it may seem like it's just the same old humdrum every day, that plunger, just working, working, working. Uh, and you can look up there and you can see the flywheel going. You can see the tines gathering it up. And you can see the crossfeed tines and, and the plunger and the knife and everything is working. But you, you know, if you was the knotter, you'd say, I'm not doing anything. Lord, what can I do? I, I've got nothing to do. You can't do anything. You can't do it. You just wait. He said, well, this brother's doing this and this church is doing that. And, and they've got this ministry over here and I've got <coughs> this over here. Lord, what, what's for me? Wait upon the Lord. <clears throat> we don't want to uh, impersonate a revelation. Think, well, everybody else is, is a shouting and jumping, and when, when the pastor says this or the visiting minister says that, and, and I don't get it, but I'm going to jump up and shout too. You're faking it. Forget it. Let's be honest. Let's be genuine. Uh, we, God doesn't need fake. He doesn't want fake. He won't have fake. Be honest. Be genuine. Let God meter out your progress. Not, it's not up to you to determine your progress. It's up to him. Don't try to get, hold of God, uh, get ahead of God's program. He's got everything timed just right. <clears throat> just be honest. Brother Brandon was honest. You know, we don't need to perform, let's say, as ministers. Brother Branham, in his early ministry, uh, he, he felt that pressure to perform. And I, I didn't look it up, but if I, under, if I remember right from reading the uh, uh, life story books and hearing his testimony, there was a time when he thought he had to get all the worst-case scenario healing, you know, the, get, bring your worst, bring your wounded, bring your lame, bring your halt, your blind, bring them up here. He was under that pressure to perform, and he got in trouble for it. And the Lord said, don't do that. Uh, and he, he had to mature. But after he matured, there's no need for that. Let's just be honest. I can't do anything unless the Lord shows me. Jesus said the same thing in John 5, 19. The son can do nothing of himself. What he seeth the father do? John 5, 30. I can of my own self do nothing. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the father. And if that's good enough for Jesus, that ought to be good enough for us. I can do nothing but what the Lord shows me. And if he hasn't shown you, then you can do nothing. Amen? Amen. Uh, so let's not try to manufacture some kind of a Bible study if God hadn't shown you anything to, to present to the brother. You're wasting their time. And, and you're being a detriment. Uh, you know, it's not just that, well, it, it, 
It'll give them something to think about. It'll, no, you're, you're being a detriment because you're faking it, you're fooling, you're duping, you're, uh, you're fooling somebody. You're fooling a brother and a sister. You're fooling a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. Uh, does, do any of the parents here want to see their children fooled or you wives or, or you husbands want to see your wives fooled by the salesman that comes around and I've got the best little product here. This, you just got to have this and your husband will love you for it. And, and uh, then he comes home and you paid what for the what? Well, he said it was good. Uh, no, honey. Uh, let me take that back. <clears throat> we don't want to see uh, Psalm 69.5. That should have been my text, I guess. I, it just was on my heart, so that's why we read it. Don't let me be, don't let my foolishness cause a stumbling block. You know, imitate a message, imitate a sermon, imitate an anointing or a, or a gift. Uh, pretend like you're something that you're not. You're causing a problem there. You're going to cause somebody to stumble. Uh, and you'll be answering to somebody uh, that you don't want to be answering to in that manner. We don't need fake. Uh, I pray that we each take this to heart uh, tonight. God doesn't appreciate it. Uh, There'll be no rewards for fake Christians. Only condemnation, judgment, because you're a hypocrite. Uh, You're dead. You're worthless. That's not really politically correct. We're not here to be politically correct. We're here, this is the house of God and the house of correction. And if you're being fake... Uh, this is his little uh, wake-up call. Let's, let's get it straight. Let's get it right. Why go on with forged uh, documents when you can have the real thing? <clears throat> There's a power in being genuine. Brother Chad read a quote, and so this will be a repeat, if nothing else has, but I know uh, these things that the Lord laid on my heart was things that Brother Chad has been covering the past few services before he went on vacation. <clears throat> yeah, Revelation chapter 4, verse, uh, third, uh, part 3, Brother Chad read this quote. Brother Ram says, Oh, how we need in Jeffersonville thousands of lived voices, the thunder of God, thundering out in sweetness and holiness, purity, undefiled lives, walking around in the earth today without a blemish. Yes, sir, real Christians. That's thunder against the enemy. The devil don't care how loud you can holler. The devil don't, the devil don't care how much you can jump or how much you can do this or shout, but what hurts the devil is to see that sanctified, holy life consecrated to God. Say anything to him, call him anything, just as sweet as it can be, and move right on. Oh, my, that throws him away. That's the thunder that shakes the devil. <clears throat> I wonder if we uh, misread that sometimes. Oh, how we need in Jeffersonville thousands of voices. That's not what Brother Bram said. That's the problem, too many voices thundering out. He didn't say we need thousands of voices. Uh, that's the problem. Too many people out there thundering out their voices, trying to make something of themselves and trying to fake an experience, committing fraud. It's just thundering, uh, just thundering voices. That's not going to shake the, ve- the devil. Brother Bram said lived voices. We need thousands of lived voices. The lived voices. That's the thunder against the enemy. Lived voices. The thunder of God thundering out. Your life your lived voice, your genuine Christian life is the thunder of God. It's not your own thunder. It's the thunder of God thundering out. Your manifested life, manifested word in you is thundering out. That's the thunder against the enemy. The best part, what was this? And this is what I always liked about this quote. How did this thunder sound out? You know, we think of th- thunder, we think of a big old booming uh, noise that scares the little children, does it? Thunder out in power and might, arrogance and pride. No, he says, thundering out in sweetness and holiness. That'll be the quietest thunder, but that's what'll move the enemy. Sweetness, thundering out in sweetness and holiness, purity. Purity, genuine. Not making it till you fa- faking it till you make it. Purity, undefiled lives walking around in the earth today without a blemish not faking it till they make it. Let me read that full quote again. Oh, how we need in Jeffersonville thousands of lived voices. The thunder of God thundering out in sweetness, in holiness, purity, undefiled lives, walking around in 
in the earth, <coughs> excuse me, in the earth today without a blemish. Yes, sir, real Christians. That's thunder against the enemy. The devil don't care how loud you can holler. The devil don't care how much you can jump or how much you can do this or shout. But what hurts the devil is to see that sanctified, holy life consecrated to God. Say anything to him, call him anything, just as sweet as it can be and move right on. Oh, my. That throws him away. You want to move the devil? You want to move the devil in your life? You want to move the devil out of your brother's life? A need in the body, this body, the body of Christ, you need to move a devil? Well, there's how you do it. Not by faking it till you make it. That's the thunder that shakes the devil. That throws him away. That genuine, consecrated, lived life. 1956, why are people so tossed about? Brother Bram said, I stood a few weeks ago where there was a big tent erected, not slamming, God forgive, where a man said he could cast out evil spirits, which I have no doubt of that, but evil spirits are not cast out by cruel, indifferent living. The most powerful weapon there is in the world is love. Uh, a cruel, indifferent living. I don't know what the definition of that would be, but it's not genuine. It's not the real deal. It's not what Brother Branham just described that would thunder out and shake the devil, move the devil, a cruel and indifferent life, faking it till they make it, living one life and then coming, uh, pretending to be something that they're not. Evil spirits are not cast out by cruel, indifferent living. Uh, think about your life. I hope it doesn't... Uh, fall into the category of cruel, indifferent. You can't move a devil that way. You know, you're not even going to be able to pray for a toothache to get it healed. Uh, you're not going to be able to move anything. You can't even move that cruel and indifferent spirit out of your own self. You need to become genuine and say, Lord, I, I, I need the real thing. <clears throat> to, so to put it in my words, evil spirits are not cast out by fake lies. <clears throat> Christian that lives a cruel and indifferent life is a counterfeit Christian, a fake, hypocrite, Pharisee, a dead, worthless. <clears throat> and that kind of life will not move a devil. I'd like to be able to move a devil. When, when I see a devil on myself or a brother or sister, they have a need in, in their body or in their life or in a congregation or in a church or a, uh, for overseas, for, for Pakistan, uh, I want to be able to move a devil, but I'm not going to be able to do it with a cruel indifferent life, anything less than genuine, sanctified, holy life, consecrated to God. Faking it till you make it is not going to make it. <clears throat> In faith cometh by hearing, 1954, Brother Ram says, now faith is burly. My, how I like to think of faith, hope, faith, and charity, those three things. And hope, what a beautiful thing hope is, little, timid hope, lovely and sweet as she is, Yet she's the greatest enemy faith has. That's right. The greatest enemy faith, faith's got is hope. I don't know that I'm real familiar with this uh, quote. Because <clears throat> a person becomes so hopeful till they leave away from faith. Well, hope's a good, good thing, right? Uh, we, we, need to, we need hope. We do. God gave us hope. Uh, but it can become where a person becomes so hopeful till they leave away from faith. It says, now hope will agree with the Bible. Hope will say it's true. Hope will say, I believe every bit of it. I believe that that's the word of God, and I believe that God will keep his promise. Hope believes all of that, but hope then says, now I believe that God will heal, but look at my condition. Now, faith don't look at that. Faith comes around. I don't care nothing about conditions, God. God says so, and it's mine. That's the way faith acts. You see, faith's burly. As I once said, faith's got hair on the chest. When it stands up and pulls its big muscles out, everything else vanishes away, just takes flies away when faith really takes a hold nothing else stands I'm telling you faith when you've got to, you've got to have hope and charity if you've got real burly faith and no love with it you ruin your influence before the people if you haven't got love mixed with it see you've seen people real burly what we would say excuse the, excuse the expression a bulldog faith to grab a hold but it's so rough with it then you see what when you do that it, does, it hasn't got the kindness there to move with it so what we need is hope, faith, and charity. Isn't that right? Hope, faith, and charity together. God help our church to have it like that, the people to have that combination. But if you just rely on hope, you hinder faith. Hope looks for something way off, but faith claims it right now. See, faith says God said so, and it's mine. That settles it. 
See, I don't care if I'm crippled, if I'm still crippled, I'm still blind, if I'm still sick, that don't have nothing to do with it. I believe it anyhow. It's mine right now. God says so, and that settles it. That's faith. But hope says, God says so, and I'm expecting to get it someday. You see, I'm expecting someday, and as long as Satan can put you off to another day, that's as good as he wants. That's right. You'll never get it. Just believe that you got it right now. It's your personal property. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is that right? Faith acts now. It's positive. There's no, oh my, I tell you, sickness and everything else. When faith steps in, it's just like a snowball on a hot stove. It just melts away. Everything goes away from faith because faith stands up and takes over rule. When faith speaks, everybody else keeps still. That's right. And let me <clears throat> read another quote here. The anointed ones at the end time. What is faith? Faith is something that's revealed to you that is not yet, but yet, but you believe it will be. Faith is a revelation of the will of God. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, sometimes it's, uh, we, we get that confused in our mind, hope and faith, and, and I'm, I'm hoping for this, but that's the enemy to faith. But when you can catch a revelation that God said so, it's settled in heaven. He's not arguing about it. Why am I arguing about it? I'm not hoping for this. It's mine. It's my possession. Now, I don't have my healing right now other than I have a promise, and that's good enough. God's cogs will move around. And it'll come to pass because God said so. And he's big enough to keep his word, and he does keep his word. He will move it around. But if you're just hoping, I'm hoping someday that this, will, this situation will, will mend itself. And You've got a promise. Stand on it. Wait on it. Believe in it. Not hope for it. Not faking it. You know, faith has substance. Fake, pretend, imitations, it has no substance. <clears throat> when we see a promise of the Word of God, we can claim it by faith, knowing that God keeps His Word, not hoping He'll keep His Word, knowing He'll keep His Word. We've got to have a revelation of that, uh, that our Heavenly Father, he, he, his, his promises are true. They're good. His cogs churn slow, but they churn sure. Don't fake it till you make it. You rest on Him. You wait on Him. He promised it. Uh, just, just get, away, get away from that faking. Would the musicians come, please, Brother uh, Blake? Brother Bram didn't have a fake trust in God. <clears throat> a fake trust, a fake belief would not have held him in his time of trouble. You know, I was talking about those uh, other ministries back in his day. There was a lot of healing ministries, and they were some tremendous uh, I've, I've seen some of the healing meetings online. I've, uh, they have those recorded, and you can, you can pull them up, some of those other uh, uh, ministries back in Brother Branham's day. Uh, phenomenal, uh, dynamic. Uh, I mean, you can could, you could pull it up today. Benny Hinn uh, doing things bigger and better than Brother Branham did, according to their, but he wasn't not bringing the word. You know, that's the most important thing to us. Uh, you know, but... Things happening, faking it. But then you see those ministries where they get in the tight spot and it doesn't hold. Uh, and that's just evidence that something's been faked. Brother Branham says, 1965, he said, He let my wife die and me holding her by the hands, crying for her. My daddy in his, ar in his arms died on, on this arm right here, looking up at me, trying to get his breath. And I prayed as hard as I could. How could I face the public again to preach divine healing? How could I preach he was a good God and let my own daddy die, a sinner? How could I preach that? I don't know how, but I know he's right. The word of God shall never fail. It'll triumph no matter what that is. Then I know there was something inside of all, the reason, of all reasonings, something inside of all emotions, everything else like that. There was an inside man that held in that hour. Nothing else could have done it. Every reason, everything, could be showed, everything could prove that it was wrong, and I was in the wrong, but the Word of God that was predestinated before the foundation of the world held on the inside. He had the real deal. He wasn't faking it. He had the real deal. I felt a little wind come through the building. Her spirit went to meet God. Brother, sister, let me tell you, that's the only thing. Don't try to reason it out. Don't try to have long hair because I said so. I don't know that I've ever heard Brother Bram say that. Don't try to have long hair. Well, let's read the full thing. Don't try to have long hair because... Let's not, 
Let's not serve God and, and walk in this message of the hour and, and believe because there was a man named William Branham said it was right. Let's let, you better get something down inside of your heart so it's a real deal. Otherwise, you're just faking it. Well, I'm trusting that Brother Branham was right. And he sounded right, and all my friends, they say it right, and this church says it's right, and you're on the wrong track. You're faking it, and that won't hold in the hour of, of your need. Don't try to reason it out. Don't try to have long hair because I said so. Don't try to do these things just because in your flesh. Don't try to do it. Just kind of cope up, but just wait before the Lord till something way down on the inside. Many of you think because you've got long hair, that means you're going to go to heaven. That doesn't mean that. Many of them think because you're a good moral woman, you're going to, it don't mean that. Many of them think because of their churches and belong to this and this great group and great doctors of divinity, that don't mean that. Many think because they speak in tongues, they've got the Holy Ghost, that don't mean that. Though the Holy Ghost does speak with tongues. But until that real genuine Holy Spirit in there will cope with every word, if that Holy Spirit in you that makes you speak with tongues looks back there and doesn't agree with the rest of the word, then it's the wrong spirit. It's got to come from the inside, which is the word from the beginning. In the beginning of the creation of God, when God began to create, bring you into existence. You see, you started back there as a seed and worked down to where you are now. And then you were all in Christ. And then when Christ died, he died to redeem all of you. And you are part of this word. And how can the Bible, all of it, precept upon precept, line upon line, here little, there little, not one jot or little or tittle shall fail. How in the world can you being part of that word, disagree with the rest of it or any part of it. If you're faking it and just relying upon your church association or, or some favorite minister with a good ministry and a, and a real genuine gift of God uh, to teach or to whatever, he, he, if that's all you're relying on, you're just faking it. You need the reality because nothing else is going to hold. Amen. Let's all stand. If you see a promise in the Word of God, claim it. Claim it. Don't fake it. Claim it. Make sure all the documents are right. Send it in and wait on the Lord. There's nothing you need to do other than believe. You don't need to manufacture the promise to you. You don't need to manufacture your healing. You don't need to manufacture the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's just faking it. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I just so appreciate, Lord, uh, the thought that you gave me, and I pray that it's been delivered in a way that <clears throat> your people will be able to receive it, Father. And it's not uh, up to me, it's not my responsibility to, uh, to make it receivable, but just to yield, Lord, for you to use this vessel as you would see fit. Father, I pray that there's something touch the heart of the people, Lord. If there's a promise that they're waiting on, that they can be reassured tonight <clears throat> that it's on the way, because your word stands true. You don't argue about it in heaven. Lord, help us, Father God, not to argue about it here on earth. Lord, but just to believe and rest, Lord. And as your metering wheel, Lord, measures out the progress of our lives, Lord, we can just trust, Father God, that when the time comes, when you've placed everything in that, in us, as I compared the bale to our own lives, Lord, the bale of hay, it doesn't tie until it's complete, Lord. And you're not going to tie us off, Lord, being incomplete. You're going to finish the work, Lord. That's your promise, and we can rest upon that. And we just pray, Father God, that you would just lead each one here, Father God. I pray that you just touch each heart and speak to each heart, Lord. If there's a question on their heart, Lord, I don't know it, Father God, but you do, Lord. I've just yielded myself, Lord, that you could take the gift, Lord. Uh, and Father, help me, Lord, not to uh, despise it or look down upon it, Lord, because it maybe is not my favorite or my choice, or my method, Lord. It's not up to me. You can do wonders with it, Lord. If we just surrender ourselves, commit it to you, Lord. I pray that each one here, Lord, be touched by your spirit, encouraged, and uh, strengthened, Lord, and receive the promise that they're waiting on, Lord. 
whatever that would be, Lord. Out in the lands, Lord, on the internet, whoever would come across this sermon, Lord, I pray that it would bless them, Lord. Bring them under conviction, encourage them, whatever is needed, Lord. We just thank you, Father God, that you keep your promises, Lord, and your word is sure. We love you, Lord, and commit the, the word to you, Father. Take us, Lord, this evening. Bless each one that's come out, Lord. And we just pray that you just keep us, Lord. Bless our brother Kadima, Lord, as he prepares for the service this weekend and, and next week as well. We just commit ourselves to you, our pastor, Lord. Bring him home safely, Lord, at the appropriate time, Father. Rejuvenated, restored, Lord. Strengthened, Lord. More invigorated, Lord, for the for the day and the hour and the word of the hour that, that we have before us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all these things, Father, and we commit them all to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew
Bless the broken peace. 
We were. 